Yes. Should we get? Yeah. Oh. Hi. You get the next one. <laughs> one <of four. laughs> um, I'm Shabnam. I'm just an average American Iranian Iranian American citizen, and I'm very happy about the ending of your story. And I'm very uh, proud to know her and to have your voices um, out on Twitter and people that I can trust and listen to and follow. And I'm just wondering. I know it's really early, um, but as far as the 2020 field goes, mm -hmm. do you have any hope w with anybody being? a little bit more pro-Iran and taking us away from this bad path that America's been on? I mean, I think that the, the terror designation makes things tough, but most of the Democratic candidates have said that they'd get back into the JCPOA mm -hmm. almost immediately. And the members of Congress that I talk to uh, say the same thing. Um, what I worry more about is the long-term hit to American credibility uh, and how we're going to undo that. Um, and obviously, people living in the United States can look at the last two plus years and think about a lot of ways our credibility has been hurt. Uh, but on this particular score that you and I happen to care a lot about, um, I just think that when the United States of America signs on to a deal, the world should be able to look at it and say, okay, they're going to live by that. And um, I don't think that that's the case right now. Thanks. As Farnaz knows, Jason and I had one very brief meeting in Tehran mm -hmm. in 2014. Right before I, had, I was arrested, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I was very taken with your uh, description there of the initial days of your arrest because it was exactly how I saw it. Uh, just um, so everyone knows, I was at that time the deputy bureau chief of Agence France Presse in Tehran. I had just arrived. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Reuters does not have foreign press in Iran. Uh, the Associated Press does not have foreign reporters in Iran. The only foreign news agency that had foreign nationals in the country at that time was AFP. And I had met Jason at a press conference, which were which are big events in Iran. Uh, it was a press uh, conference of the president, uh, Hassan Rouhani, uh, because again, what people won't understand is in Iran, you can't just phone up the State Department. It doesn't work that way. There is one foreign uh, ministry briefing, uh, if you're lucky, weekly, uh, where you get just a little bit of an insight into what's going on in one ministry. And no, no, no questions from foreigners. Exactly, no questions ever. from foreigners ever. Yeah. You have to basically, yeah, you basically like have to piecemeal everything else, and it's like a chessboard. You have to move the pieces around and try and work out what your angle of attack is going to be. But anyway, going back to the point, um, I'll come to my question, but the, but the description is relevant to your, uh, your answer. I remember exactly when you were arrested, and I remember the very first press reports that came out. It came out in Vatan Emruz, which is a daily newspaper run by an ally of the former president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, which detailed in fairly, which you're obviously very familiar with, unflattering terms, the spying charges against you. We, as, as a foreign news agency, had made our own inquiries, and it's exactly as you said. We were told by uh, Ershad, which is the Ministry of uh, the, shall we say, not a, it's not a short description, the Ministry of uh, Islamic, Islamic Culture, sorry, Culture and Islamic Guidance, uh, who control the activities of foreign uh, reporters in Iran. We had been told, oh, it's okay, this, 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 it's a mistake, you know, this, this will be sorted out soon. Yeah. So the culture was exactly as you, as you thought yourself. Oh, this is a mistake, you know. Uh, well, we'll get this sorted out, you know, because the precedents were kind of like maybe a couple of months, something like that. that. Obviously, didn't happen. Things started to deepen. Things started to darken. But again, you're—I mean, it's very pertinent for everyone. It was a domestic scenario at the time. Yep. Someone decided we're going to make a move, and this guy will be helpful. And I think it's one of the 
deep tragedies and ironies of your incarceration is that you were incarcerated the entire time of the negotiations that led to what was a remarkable breakthrough in diplomacy. And I just really wondered, while you were incarcerated, did you have any indication at all of all the negotiations that were going on, or were you completely in the dark? Because we had various reports that you had been deprived access to any journals or everything. Uh, I just really wondered yeah. how it was. So I had, in those first seven weeks that I was in solitary confinement, access to nothing. Um, and that is a terrible place to be. Right? You have no uh, frame of reference on anything, and you know the one thing that was continually driven home was I didn't have the right to ask questions. So I had no idea what was going on uh, in the world or uh, in negotiations. Um, but uh, when I came out of solitary, the cell that I was put into had TV. And it had TV, you know, like Iranian state television. It wasn't like I was getting Netflix or anything like that. Uh, or, or CNN or Fox or anything like that. It was, it was the whole um, kind of buffet of Iranian state channels. Um, so I had press TV. Um, I had I, the IRIB, all the, the different channels. And a week or two after I was, was put in that cell was when the UNGA happened here in New York. And as you may know, that's the time of year that Rouhani and Zarif, you know, uh, powder their noses and put on their best dancing shoes and, you know, um, come to New York and, and do what they do. Um, and, the state media, it was, it was odd. They were showing um, raw footage from those various events that Rouhani and Zarif were doing. And one of them was a, um, a roundtable that they did with news execs. And uh, you know, there's no voiceover. There's no nothing. It's just raw footage. I can imagine the average Iranian tuning into this is like, why am I, what is this, right? And I'm fascinated. I'm sitting there watching, you know, questions about the, the negotiations. And then my boss gets up and asks a question about me and my wife. And so that was the first indication for me that, okay, you know, something is being done on our case. As the time went on, I watched those negotiations closely. And I learned a lot about how the... Um, Islamic Republic, you know, power structure viewed those negotiations. You know, it was really important for them, but it was also something that they needed to remain skeptical about publicly. And I consumed hundreds, maybe thousands of hours of, of their media coverage uh, and dozens of hours about me, right? And the first time that you see footage of a member of parliament calling for your execution, uh, it's pretty disconcerting. Uh, but then the second or third time that you realize, oh, you know, these are just responses to things that are going out in the rest of the world. Good things that are being said, right? Um, so, you know, I, I didn't have access to all that was being said and written about me, obviously. Uh, but when my wife and my mom could come and see me, they would pass along notes of information. Not, not actual, you know, handwritten notes, but, but information. Um, and so I was able to form a bit of a worldview of, of what was going on. And I mean, I knew, as anybody who was covering Iran knew before I was arrested, that the writing was on the wall. This deal was going to happen. Both sides wanted it to happen. It's just a matter of time, right? And I, I told my captors this all the time. I said, you know, you guys think that by taking me you can make a, a dent in this. I don't matter. And nothing matters. Your, your power structure, going back to your question about the IRGC, they wanted this deal not to happen. The part of it that had control of me. 
But the Supreme Leader had decided that it was going to happen with other parts of the IRGC and Rouhani and, and, uh, and others. And the Obama administration decided it was going to happen. So, yeah, I, I had some insight and, and the ability to see it from an Iranian angle. And I, I learned how to be a conscientious, conscientious, conscientious consumer of Iranian state propaganda. <laughs> yeah. There were people who didn't think it was going to happen, but there was. It was, the stakes were too high for failure for both sides, right. which is why those of us with a slightly, and this, uh, there were legacy correspondents and all sorts of people who said, oh, this is never going to happen. And I said, I think if you look at the, the facts, it, it, it looks pretty, pretty obvious it's going to yeah. happen. And it did happen. It took longer than they thought, but it, it did happen. However, again, given especially your knowledge before and here, how damaging is it given that it took almost 40 years for there to be any direct negotiations between Iran's top establishment figures and America's yep. diplomats. Given that happened, given there was always that lack of trust, but given it happened and there was a deal that during, never mind after the election, during the campaign for the election, which was ongoing only months after the implementation of the deal, Trump made a speech at APAC saying, I'm going to tear up the Iran nuclear deal. It fatally undermined any chance of diplomatic traction and throughput. How damaging do you think that is? Not only now, but going forward. Because again, if, if you do it, if you sign a deal with someone right. and they pull out, why would you do a deal with them again? I don't think it's, uh, I think it's incredibly damaging but uh, not fatally so, because, you know, Zarif is still here saying we want to sit down and talk, right? And I think that that sort of plays to uh, Trump's instincts, right? He wants to talk, too. He's got he wants this whole, a photo op. He wants a on. photo op, and he wants, you know, he wants a whole bunch of things, right? But, you know, he doesn't want to be held back, and there are people saying, well, sir, don't, you know, you can't talk to them, they're evil. Right? And he said, well, you know what? I, I was laundering money with them not too long ago. What's <laughs> I mean, I can't believe that story didn't get more traction in the New, New York. Yorker piece. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, so, you know, I, I think all bets are off in, in a certain way, but uh, I, I don't think that the prospects are good in the short term. And I think, you know, there will be a crisis in Iran, you know, before too long when the Supreme Leader dies, and, you know, things will change. Things are always changing. I think both sides are trying to gauge each other. I think yeah. uh, we've gone from Trump saying, we, I really want to sit down with Iranians, to tweeting, Rouhani is a lovely man, right before the GA. Um, and uh, I think I the Iranians... Yeah, never <laughs> and I think the, the, <laughs> prison, the families of the current American detainees told me that um, the administration told them we've reached out to Iran eight times to talk about prisoners and Iranians have not replied. So it's very good news that Zarif's actually now making this initiative. There's well, hope. But, but what he said today was that six months ago we reached out to them and, and they if did. they said that, right. that that didn't happen, they're lying. Yeah. So, you know, this is kind yeah. of, you know, um, but I think that ultimately there won't be a war and I think that there will be negotiations. I just don't know when. I don't know what they'll be over. How?